heaven's throne for us with eternity in mind to redeem the wounded soul to bring the way born of man he lived to die for his own Sacrifice our sin and shame, he washed away. Oh, the prize our Savior paid. To God be the glory, great things he has done, and all the earth sing his praise.
Blessed Easter Sunday to each and every one of you. A special warm welcome to those of you who are joining us for the very first time at our church. I'm so glad you're able to join us as we celebrate the risen Saviour, Jesus Christ. We will start with a time of praise and worship led by Eunice. Then I will lead us in a time of Holy Communion. So I humbly encourage all of us to put aside all distractions and let's worship together the risen Lord Jesus Christ, our living hope. Good morning, everyone. Today, as we celebrate the resurrection of the Lord, let's praise our Maker who has redeemed us and has set us free from every darkness. Hallelujah to the One who has lifted us from sinking sin, who forgave us and called us His children. He is our hope, our living hope. Let's sing the song together. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name. Sealed the promise. You're buried by. 
Thank you, Lord. There's victory in Jesus. Thank you. We praise you, Jesus. For you alone, our strength when we are weak. And you alone, our hope when we feel everything around us seems to be falling apart. You reached down and you lifted us up and you gave us renewed strength. Lord, I want to pray right now for those who are still searching for solutions and those who are hurting right now. Jesus, reach out to them and lift them up and pour your unfailing love which never changes, Lord. May you be their strength, Lord. Church, shall we sing this song? You are my strength. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Yes, Jesus. You are my strength. Strength like no
you, Lord. Lord, we thank you for that love, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for that love that demonstrated for us on that cross. And today we sing, because you live, we can face our tomorrow with confidence, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. Let's just lift him up as we sing this song, because he lives. God's hand is He lives, we can face tomorrow. Because Jesus lives, all fear is gone. Because we know He holds the future and life is worth the living. Just because Jesus lives. And this is what Easter Sunday is all about. It is all about God sending His one and only Son, Jesus Christ, and Jesus came to love, to heal, and to forgive. He lived and died to buy our pardon. An empty grave is there to prove our Saviour lives. The Word of God says that by His grace, whoever believes in Jesus will have eternal life. As Christians, we are not only believers of Jesus, but we must also grow to walk in obedience to God. On this side of eternity, it is easy for us to be distracted by the attractions and worries in this world. We can easily fall into sin. And therefore, it is important for all of us to walk in repentance. The communion is a time for Christians to not only remember what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross, but also a time of self-examination and to come authentically before the Lord and to allow the Holy Spirit to reveal to us parts of our lives that are not pleasing to God and the sins in our hearts. As we prepare to partake this Holy Communion together, I want to invite all of us to take time 
to come quietly before the Lord, allowing the Holy Spirit to move in our hearts and for Him to point out areas of sin in our lives. I now invite all of us to close our eyes and be still before the Lord. Eternal God and Heavenly Father, we come humbly before you, giving thanks for your Son, Jesus Christ, for all that he has done for us. And as we, your people, gather to partake the Holy Communion together on Easter Sunday, we ask that once again you may reveal to us any sins that we hide in our hearts. The word of the Lord says in Psalms 139, verse 23 to 24, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous ways in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Lord, search our hearts. You know what is in each of our hearts and minds. And we come to you this day in humble repentance. Forgive us of any grievous way in us. Thank you once again for your love and your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us partake the Holy Communion together as a church family. The Bible says on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, He was having supper with His disciples. He took bread and gave thanks, broke it, and said to His disciples, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's break bread and partake of it together. After they had eaten bread, he took the cup of wine and said, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Let's drink it in remembrance of him. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, remember what you have done on the cross for us. Thank you for dying for our sins. And we praise you, Lord, for your resurrection power and for giving believers the wonderful privilege of being able to worship and fellowship with you both now and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope of no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remained my orphan heart was given a name My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance When death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace so free washes over Release from my 
chains I'm a prisoner no more My shame was a ransom He faithfully bore He cancelled my debt And he called me his friend When death was arrested And my life began Oh, your grace so free Washes over Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hell And now I would like to invite all of us to give of our tithe and offering to the Lord. And as the QR codes appeared on the screen, as we scan and give to the Lord, let us also take the time to give thanks for all that the Lord has done in our families and in our lives. Lord, we offer to you our praise and thanks with this tithes and offering. May they be used wisely for the furtherance of your gospel in your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. From next Sunday, 11 April onwards, our online services will be live streamed instead of the online service commencing at 9.15 a.m. We'll be starting at 10 30 a.m. But please join us five minutes before for the pre-service prayer to prepare yourself. 
we were streamlined from this same YouTube link. It is now my privilege to introduce our guest speaker for this year's Easter Sunday's message. After retiring as the ninth Bishop of Singapore from the year 2012 to 2020, Bishop Rennie's Ponaya continues his ministry of preaching, teaching and leadership development as the Honorary Fellow of St. Peter's Hall, the Diocese Training and Spiritual Formation Arm. He also served as the Executive Secretariat of the Global South Fellowship of the Anglican Churches. It was my special honour to serve alongside Bishop Rennes as the Chairman of the Celebration of Hope from 2017 to 2019. Let's now welcome Bishop Rennes Ponaya as he brings to us God's Word from John 20 verses 1 to 18 when God breaks His silence. How wonderful for me to be gathered with the people of Covenant Evangelical Free Church this Easter. A sign of the times and a great gift from God that the body of Christ in Singapore can have this freedom of worshipping together across boundaries and proclaiming Jesus Christ together. It's a special thrill for me that I have found spiritual friends among the pastors at CE. FC. I want to bring a special greeting to those who are participating uh, in this service online who may not be from the Covenant Evangelical Free Church community. For all of us, let our common desire be to meet the risen Lord Jesus as we open the Word of God together. Let us pray. O oh God, our Heavenly Father, we are hearing your word today, not by chance, but by your grace and your providence. We come as we are with our hopes and fears, needing divine help to hear your word in the heart, to believe your word and to respond to your word. So come, Holy Spirit, illumine our hearts and minds that we may behold Jesus Christ, who is alive today, and we might follow him all of our days. In his name and for his glory. Amen. I want to read from John's Gospel, chapter 20, verses 1 to 18, as we are transported back to the events on that resurrection morning. John's Gospel, chapter 20, starting at the first verse. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head not lying with the linen cloths but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, 
one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When evil powers go unchecked, when there is a lot of innocent suffering in the world, when uh, the cause of history seems to be entirely in the hands of people in power, it is not uncommon to ask, where is God in all this? And why isn't he doing something to alter the cause of events? The COVID pandemic, its extent, its duration, its long-term effects have intensified this question about the apparent silence of God. Things were also getting darker in the events that led to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. One of his own disciples chose to betray him. Chief priests and religious authorities, they succeed in their malicious plot to fix him up. A weak-willed Roman governor gives in to the bellowing crowd and then Jesus is scourged and crucified. Evil was in the ascendancy. And God seemed uh, so distant and so silent. Or so we think. And then, on the third day after the crucifixion, comes the resurrection of Jesus. What a way for God to break his silence. That's my topic for this Easter day, when God breaks his silence. That's indeed what God did when he raised Jesus from the dead. An earth-shaking, history-changing, life-transforming action by the God of the universe. Our scripture reading from John chapter 20 allows me to draw out three things which result from God raising Jesus from the dead. First, there is living hope to be grasped. Easter, my friends, is the birth of Christian hope. The Apostle Peter says, according to God's great mercy, he has caused Christians to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Born again, a totally new and endless life because we have received great hope through the resurrection of Jesus. Hope is the certainty that there is a good and satisfying future for you. In fact, when your hope is in Jesus, that future is very great and full of glory. It is also a living hope because it is a hope that will not fade away. 
Rather, belief in the resurrection of Jesus keeps nourishing that hope from within. In other words, it's a lively hope. It lives in you and affects everything that you do. The resurrection of Jesus gives us a living hope because death is defeated. Jesus rose from the dead bodily, never to die again. Hence the emphasis in the reading from John chapter 20, the emphasis on the burial cloths. Uh, it, would, it's, it is described in such a way that the cloths, the linen cloths on the ledge on which our, the body of our Lord lay, uh, that, those cloths, as it were, just collapsed as they had been placed. There is little sign that the body of Jesus was picked up and unwrapped, but rather that his body had disappeared through the linen cloths. The linen cloths had slumped on the ledge like a collapsed balloon uh, for which the air has gone out. And remarkably, we are told that the single piece over the head also had collapsed at a place where the head of our Lord would have lain. So this is a bodily resurrection. The body out of, a new body out of the old. So the nail marks and the pierced side are there. But it's an undecaying body that will be able to enter the realm of heaven. It is equally at home in heaven as it is on earth. A body with new properties. What does this mean? Our bodies, the body of our Lord, he's the firstborn from the dead, has been raised. Well, it means that all the effects of sin Man's rebellion against God has been overturned by the Son of God. It is finished, he cried on the cross, knowing that it would lead to this victory, God's victory over sin and darkness and death. This is the source of Christian hope and all mankind's hope for the future takes a new dimension because if there is life and life in the body after death, then this is an entirely new dimension of hope. There is life with God beyond the grave for all who trust in Jesus. Because of the resurrection of Jesus, death is no longer a wall. Everything crashes and ends. Death is no longer a wall, but a bridge a bridge into the life with God that is to come. A life in the very presence of God, something the Old Testament had longed for and had perceived, but only sporadically, that in your presence I will have joy forevermore. And whom have I in heaven but you, but now fulfilled in Jesus. And that is why Jesus said during his earthly life, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives, everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Will never die, will never be separated from the life and presence of God. Do you believe these words of Jesus? In 2015, there was a double earthquake in Nepal. And the Anglican Church, we had already planted some congregations. And the faithful witness of the Christians, first in love, in sharing whatever they had, and in coming to help those in need because of the earthquake and all the disaster and pain it brought, it ravaged people's lives. But the Christians also shared their faith, that they believed in the resurrection after death. And God, by His Spirit, brought conviction to so many lives 
the church in Nepal grew by leaps and bounds in an accelerated way in the context of a double earthquake. So much death around them. But the living hope, Jesus has conquered. There is life in God after death. That's what brought these conversions and these new lives. Our physical death is but the beginning of a perfect union with God. And when Jesus returns, my friends, we too will receive our resurrected bodies. Then death will be swallowed up. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Because God has overturned everything, all the effects of sin through the resurrection of Jesus. Not only has death been defeated, but the new creation has begun. So the language of John chapter 20 brings echoes of Genesis 1 and 2, when God first created the universe and first created man. And John writes in this way so that you and I might know that the resurrection is the launching of the new creation. And so John writes about this being the first day of the week. And while it is still dark, that's when they discover that the tomb is empty. And in John's gospel, we are in a garden, a reminiscent of the garden in Eden. And even Mary Magdalene, uh, mistakenly supposing that the person talking to her was the gardener, well, wrong at one level, but profoundly right at another, because Jesus is the new Adam, the new keeper of the garden of God. And this world now, with Christians leading the way, is the Edenization. God recreating the world. And the sign that he's, the kingdom is already here, the new creation is launched, is he raised Jesus from the dead. So we are headed to the new heaven and the new earth. God's new creation. But friends, it's already begun now with the bodily resurrection of Jesus. And after he was raised from the dead, not many days later, he would pour out his spirit on his followers so that renewed by the spirit, we can renew the earth for the Lord. It'll only be complete when he returns, but it has begun. So my friends, that's our glorious inheritance. A new heaven and a new earth. No more sighing, no more tears, no more pain, no more suffering, no more conflict. God reigning from end to end in a universe where sin is expunged, darkness removed, death defeated. That's where we're headed. Last year, uh, I reached at the age of 65, which in the Anglican Church marks the retirement of the diocesan bishop. And so after that, I looked down the stretch that is now before me, past 65. I must confess that, well, I thought of it in terms of uh, diminishing physical and mental capacities, more visits to the doctors or to the hospital, and then the foreboding river of death to be crossed didn't bring much cheer. But then the word of God and the resurrection of Jesus caused me to look beyond. He has now secured an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading kept in heaven for you and for me. That's what he's accomplished. So I looked beyond the immediate, if you like, or the natural cause of events and saw this glorious future kept for me. And he will keep me until I get there. And that sustains me as I go forward in life. Do you live with this future in mind? It's important, my friends,
because life is tough and we do have to cross all the challenges of aging and all the vicissitudes of life. But see your present from the perspective of a completed, consummated, all is well future. That's what Jesus has done for us. A glorious future with resurrected bodies. And so this gives new meaning and new depth to the verse that many of us know. It says in Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to give you a future and a hope. It was in the context of the exile and coming back to the Holy Land and the people of God having the fullness here. But the resurrection of Jesus takes this beyond. He has prepared a future and a hope kept in heaven for us. That's where we're headed. So the resurrection of Jesus gives us living hope to be taken hold of, to be grasped. Secondly, the resurrection of Jesus means there is new life to be lived. That there is new life now come upon us because of the resurrection of Jesus can be traced from the conversation that the risen Christ has with Mary Magdalene. He says to Mary Magdalene, do not cling to me. For I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Do you see, friends? This new life brings in a new relationship with God. God is Jesus' Father in a unique way. But what does our Lord say? My Father and your Father, my God, and your God. He has broken open a new and living way where you and I experience God as loving Father. That's at the very heart of the new life. And it begins with the foundation of the forgiveness of sins. For we have all sinned and grieved God, and fallen short of the glory of God. We are defiled within our words and thoughts and our actions. They show us again and again just how fallen we are. And the shame and guilt that accompany all the things that we have done wrong in our life, taken away by the finished work, the death, and resurrection of Jesus. Your sins I will remember no more. And with that forgiveness of sins comes the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit changing us from within, changing our desires, renewing us in our inner thoughts and motives and breaking our habits. That's newness of life. And it all comes in this new relationship with God. And Jesus, he says, go tell my brothers. He's a brother for you and me. Having shared our life in his humanity, he's the brother who work, walks alongside us. This new life is nothing less than entry into the light of Christ's kingdom. Because when you come to trust in Jesus and say, you're my Lord, you're my Savior, there is a burst of light upon your heart and upon the path of your life. That's what this new entry is because you move out of darkness. One writer says, it is a startling exit from the womb of darkness, of ignorance and of of your love for the things contrary to God. It's a startling exit from that darkness into the marvelous light of Christ. And it only happens when you are born again. So coming to Jesus is not an intellectual ascent of what he has done. It is saying, you're my Lord. 
you have forgiven my sins. It's no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. Jesus said it plainly, you must be born again. Now this new life is a seed that must grow and it is needing to grow in a context of darkness and conflict and the fallenness of our nature. So the new creation has truly begun in us, but it is not yet complete. It has to handle the reality of a contested world where darkness is still our experience. So how do we grow? We can only grow by experiencing the power of Christ's resurrection. There are many enemies to this new life, my friends. The pull of the world to live in worldly ways and for worldly rewards. The dark side of our fallen nature, which loves darkness more than light, which wants to satisfy its own cravings, which tends to live in deception and falsehood. And then the destructive schemes of the devil, both subtle and blatant. They are, in the words of the psalmist, enemies too strong for us. Add to that, you know, this contest with darkness, both without and within. Add to that the trials of this life. Bereavement, pandemic, debilitating illness, miscarriage, loss of jobs, being cheated. And the reality of innocent suffering. Uh, innocent suffering because of hostility in many parts of the world. There's hostility because of your ethnic group or because of your faith and innocent suffering because it's a fallen creation and we're subject to illness and to the effects of natural disasters. How do you overcome all these and stay true to the new life of Christ in you? How do you keep growing in the new life? By a power greater a greater power than the powers of darkness is the power of God who raised Jesus Christ from the dead. St. Paul expressed it this way, that I may know him, Jesus, and the power of his resurrection. To know means to experience. It means to possess here and now this great inward strength to overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil, and to overcome the setbacks in life. It's an inward strength that only God can give. And that inward strength is described for us, for example, in Ephesians chapter 1. This inward strength is the strength of the mighty power of God who raised Jesus Christ from the dead. It's the power God exercised in raising Christ from the dead. That's the power at work within us. So may you and I remember when we wrestle with temptations, when we are beaten down by life's trials, there is a great inward strength. It's the strength of the power of God when he raised Jesus from the dead. There is that power, beloved. And we can tap into that power. And it's that power that carries us through. May, may I just quickly say, yeah, to be a bishop or to be a senior pastor is humanly impossible. Except for the inward strength of God, to stay true to God and to be spiritually vibrant for God, to be a conduit of his life is humanly impossible apart from this inward strength. May you and I know it as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus today. There is great, the powers of darkness are great, but greater still is Christ within you and the power by which God raised him from the dead. Now, how, does, how do we grow in this power? What provision has God made for us to know Christ's resurrection power? The answer is the local church and its disciple-making process. 
That's how we grow and experience this power. Knowing the scriptures, being committed to care for one another, being witnesses in the world and staying true to God through all the changing scenes of life. You need the local church and the disciple making commitments. You need to be accountable in a, in a commitment of love that we might stay true to him and grow in this power. My heart and my flesh may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forevermore. The resurrection of Jesus tells us the full impact of that. So living hope to be grasped, new life to be lived. Now, finally, good news to be proclaimed. The resurrection of Jesus means there is good news to be proclaimed. The risen Jesus said to Mary, go, go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father. And that is exactly what Mary did. Because in chapter 20, which we read, verse 18, she went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And he had said these things to her. Mary becomes the first messenger of the gospel. I have seen the Lord. He is risen. Not only is risen, but he's ascending. She may not have known the full import of that. But what it means is Jesus is going to be raised and to be seated at the right hand of God, ruling the whole history and the whole creation. He is God's king and he has ascended and he's reigning. Isn't that wonderful, friends? And that's what she's already intimating. The Lord, Jesus, is Lord and he has taken his place. So she is the first messenger and she triggers the line of gospel messengers since that first resurrection morning. Soon the disciples, the first disciples will be commissioned by the risen Christ to take the gospel to the ends of the world. That, my friends, has continued. The line of messengers has continued over the centuries to this day. Missionaries and dispersed Christians brought the gospel to Singapore and today you and I are to bring the good news of God's risen King to the people around. Everybody's got to know who Jesus is. That's the title of a chorus I grew up knowing. So a line of messengers starting from Mary to now, but I also point out the unchanging message to all people. It's an unchanging message that we are to bring to the world, that Jesus was delivered up for our transgressions and that he was raised for our justification. He was delivered up for our transgressions. In other words, he died on the cross for our sins and he was raised to life for our justification. What that means, friends, is that he was raised to life to show that God accepted his offering and declared us now not guilty. He declared us righteous in Christ. He, and so we are put right with God, raised to life for our justification. And this is the good news. That when it's proclaimed, it brings salvation in its full extent. Salvation, new life now, and a glorious eternity with God. A life that is endless and transformed. We are saved, saved to be a blessing. And so Paul issues the challenge this way. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Yeah, that's the news we need to get out. It has the power to save. This gospel has the power to regenerate our lives and usher us into a whole new world. A whole new world has begun. It's not yet complete, but by the power of the resurrection, we are being changed from glory to glory and we're bringing renewal and life and hope to a lost and fallen world. This is what, in fact, we sought to proclaim in the celebration of hope. 
such a joy to have 231 churches and Christian organizations in Singapore come together to proclaim this hope, this certainty of a new and bright and satisfying future that is in the name of Jesus. We had 2,000 new lives added to the kingdom from the rallies themselves, not to count those that have followed after the rallies. But the point is, personal evangelism and discipleship must continue. And COVID conditions are God's chosen conditions for the good news to be proclaimed. Let me summarize. The resurrection of Jesus gives us a living hope to be grasped gives us new life to be lived, gives us good news to be proclaimed. Since God broke his silence by raising Jesus from the dead, how can we be silent? Let us run to Jesus and let us speak for Jesus, the firstborn the Saviour, the Lord of all the earth and heaven. In his name, amen. Father, thank you for your word. As we ponder your word, I just invite you to close your eyes for a moment. Jesus is alive. And he is present on this side of eternity. Even as he reigns at the right hand of God. It's a mystery, but it's wonderfully true. Would you run to him? Because he alone can quicken, make alive. He alone can stir this hope in you of a certain and glorious future, a hope that will energize you and strengthen you to live for him, to make you a messenger. Thank you, Lord. And so, Lord, let the joy and glory of Easter fill our souls and flow out of our lives to bring honor and praise to you. In Jesus' name, Amen. Then on the third, at break of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again. Who oh, trembled death? Where is your sting? The angels wrong for Christ the King.
are three reflection questions for your small group and family discipleship conversations. One, how does Jesus' resurrection from the dead give you hope in some aspect of your life today? Two, what steps will you take to be a messenger of hope to someone else today to help that person find hope in the God who raised Jesus Christ from the dead? Three, from time to time, we will all face situations of dislocation, distress and oppression. We need in such times to find our hope in God. With the resurrection of Christ in mind, would you read Psalms 42 to 43 together and then pray for one another? Let's unite our hearts as we receive the Lord's benediction. And now may the God of peace who brought back again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ equip you with all you need for doing His will. May He produce in you through the resurrection power of Jesus Christ all that is pleasing to Him, grasping the living hope, living the new life, and proclaiming the good news. To Him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Have a blessed and glorious Easter Sunday.